Well, good day, and uh, welcome to our uh, Care Point today. And uh, we are meeting with John Guido today. Uh, John and I have known each other for quite some time, and it's really good to see you, John. Lovely to be with you, Neil. Yeah, uh, John uh, is the coordinator of outreach and partnerships with L'Arche uh, Canada. And we have been part of a number of different projects and events uh, together over the years and have had an opportunity to get to know each other quite well. And uh, so today uh, we're just going to be talking a little bit to, to John and the experience of L'Arche right now during this time as well. And so John, right off the top, uh, how is the coronavirus impacting you? Thanks, Neil. Uh, you know, I, like most people, um, especially who are not on the, the front line of supporting people in uh, hospitals or nursing homes or in, in the case, even in my case, I'm not um, a paid support person in large homes anymore. So um, although I have many close friends there and I'm part of the circles of support of some of my friends in large, um, I'm actually not able to visit the large homes these days. I'm, we're being very careful and, and trying to protect people's health and safety. Uh, so, the, so it's you know like uh, like all of us who aren't directly impacted. It's still been it's been a long two months, and uh, I, I, I'm I'm realizing more than ever how much I miss all those places. I, I have many people in my life, and I'm still maintaining those relationships, but I miss the YMCA where being part of those wonderful mix of people of all ages or the St. Paul's Church or concerts in the parks now that the summer is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, those places where you just belong to that wider community, um, they're, they're, they're rare. Walking the dog helps, at least I'm, I'm out there with other people, um, but it's, it's not the same. We're not part of a collective that's experiencing something together. I think, uh, that raises for me some concerns. You know, I, I'm really concerned for families with, uh, where there's a, a child with a disability, an adult with a disability living with their family, uh, who may not have the circle of connections that I do. You know, I'm able to volunteer for large, even though I can't go in the house, I can cook meals, I can, can um, pick up things for them. I can, we were connecting through Zoom and FaceTime, having community gatherings and meetings. Uh, but I know that there's a lot of people who don't have those connections and they're, they're very low, uh, isolated now. And, uh, and I worry too that the, what we, how we value people with disabilities um, at a time when, when they're not considered essential workers, uh, that they're, they're, not, um, they're, they're seen as people who need the care, who need to be protected, um, but no one's, uh, they might, there's the risk that no one's seeing what they have to offer and what um, unique gifts they have uh, because we're in such a, a protective environment. And, and I worry that that'll diminish even when we begin to reconnect because it was always a bit fragile for, for people with disabilities to feel that they were seen as some, a valuable contributor in the community. Um, and, and I'm worried about that decreasing as you know, we come out of this through perhaps some difficult economic times ahead. This, um, my, it was my birthday on May 1st, so I know that, that when you, uh, one of the things that's hard for some people is, is, is that we aren't able to have the people we love together in the room with us to give us hugs and, and uh, celebrate directly with us and share a meal um, on a special day like that. But for me, I was very touched by the community of Large Toronto, which I'm part of. Um, they, they created a video and uh, people, saying happy birthday. Uh, happy birthday on Zoom is a disaster, by the way, because hearing 30 people try to sing happy birthday at the same time sounds horrific. But, but they each individuals recorded it in, uh, on this video and people just affirm things they appreciate that about me. And, and I was very struck. So that for me, that was a better birthday than, 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 than others because it was, uh, I got all the affirmation without having to be the center of attention. But uh, the, the thing that struck me most was, was my friend, buddy Greg, and, and you know Greg because we've given talks before at Theology and Disability Conferences, and, and uh, we, we, Greg and I have spoken together for 30 odd years uh, to many, many groups. And uh, in some ways our life journey has been uh, as companions on the journey, like uh, the, the early disciples. And 
but Greg spoke very beautifully and, and, and I, I would love to share what uh, he had to say because I think it's a very important message for this time. Well, we, we would love to hear that, yes. And thanks, John, for helping me when I need help. And thank you for letting me help you when you needed help. Yeah, you guys are good friends, huh? Yeah. 35 years. Wow. 1985. Wow. Time flies. Yeah. So you got to know in 1985, uh, you were, what, 10? <laughs> 23. Uh, just out of university and, and formation for the Holy Cross Priest, which I had, had left after university. And uh, Greg welcomed me with, with three other people with disabilities to a home in Toronto. I just moved from the United States I did, and in a significant way formed me in uh, L'Arche and also living in Toronto. And, and uh, we've been connected ever since. But, but that point he was making is, you know, you know, I think a lot of people um, are very affirming to people who support people with disabilities or caregivers in other settings. And at this time of crisis, we're very clear that, that, that the, it's important that people get the care that they need and supports they need. But the significant thing for, that Greg's naming is that, I, that he was also, in, in addition to thanking me for helping him, he was really recognizing and thanking me for allowing him to help me. And uh, he, has a per he is a person with m much to give. And uh, you know, he lived a lot of years of his life before he came to L'Arche where nobody ever asked him to help. The importance of reciprocity in the relationship, eh? Yeah, we all have something to give and we all have, we all have needs. So why do we say some people are those who are cared for and other people are the ones who are caregiving? We, we, you know, how do we build a community of care? You know, Greg's very, the first time Greg made a public talk was at a, a conference in, in Marquette University called Communities That Care. And it wasn't communities where some people care for other people. It was, it was communities that care for each other with, with mutual respect. And you know, our gifts and, and what we have to offer and what we need aren't the same. There, there's differences between us. Yeah. But everybody has something to offer. And, uh, I'm hoping that important. the lessons and maybe some of the things that we're learning during this time um, of isolation, of, of having to draw together and depend and become more inter interdependent and recognizing the importance of connections and relationships. And, and I'm hoping that's one of the things that can be sustained through this as well. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, COVID has display, shown us that it doesn't matter how much power you have, how much you can be the head of a country or the military, and, and, and this, this little virus can, can, um, has, has more power, and, and we can feel powerless in front of that. Yeah. And yet, we also see this extraordinary outpouring of community where, where people are, you know, sometimes people are discovering who their neighbors are. In, in Toronto, we don't know our neighbors. You know, we're not, we're not in small town Ontario, or I lived in, in, in Hamilton for a while, and, and I got to know my neighbors. It was exciting. In, in, in Toronto, it, that's harder. Um, you know, people belong in, in little communities of belonging, um, in a church or a school or wherever they live to belong. But, but for neighbors to actually say, you know, I have a neighbor who might need help, um, or, I might need my neighbor to help me. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we're recognizing the importance of that and that the, you know, the smallest acts are, could be very, very valuable when we're, when, because we need, we need to know that we're connected. <laughs> and talking about the importance of community, uh, how has this been impacting L'Arche more broadly? Thanks for asking that. Yeah, for L'Arche, this, I mean, these are the themes that are very important to us, you know, and it, it is, um, it hasn't been uncomplicated like for everybody else that we're, we're connect, disconnected. Uh, we can be, we're physically disconnected, although we are doing our best to stay socially connected. And, and uh, who ever knew? I mean, I, even when I, I, I talked to a, uh, a friend who has Down syndrome who, and uh, he, he uh, wanted to connect and I said, on what? WhatsApp or Zoom or like he decided on Facebook, uh, 
video messaging. I didn't even know that that was a thing. So uh, there's, there's so many ways of connecting. And thank goodness there's so many because we're using all of them right now. Um, and so we are, we're being very creative about uh, people are creating art programs in, the ho in homes. There's a, I think we're exploring every type of craft and, and creative art and, and uh, developing games. Uh, uh, bingo and bowling are, are things you can still do uh, at home and online. And uh, so I think that explosion of creativity and connection is really what is helping people discover resilience because their lives are quite diminished. Many people aren't able to go. And for some people, that's harder than others. I think there's some of our members are struggling. Um, they need routines um, and uh, they, they need those connections. Um, with with people at programs that, that help them and so so replicating those creating new routines like you talked about that on your last care point i think uh and that, that that's really important that we for some people I, it was very interesting that for uh one of my friends who had lived in an institution as a child and another friend who lived at home with his mom but they were pretty isolated the beginning of covid was very very hard because they felt they were, it was like a re-traumatization. They were going back to that time when they had uh, very few people in their lives and they weren't, they, they had no freedom to move and they, they felt trapped and, uh, and they experienced that again. And, and it really took a while for them to process that and to be able to see, it meant a lot to them that, that all of us are experiencing that uh, to some degree or other. Um, COVID also has impacted L'Arche pretty directly because um, six of our elderly members in France have died. They were all, all living in long-term care homes uh, near their communities, but they were very active members of their large communities. Um, and uh, so that was very, very painful. You know, when you, you, you realize you're an international family because it feels so close to home. Uh, and one of our members in Canada who has an intellectual disability uh, also uh, became sick with COVID and uh, was very critically ill in, in intensive care. And uh, took, he was younger, so thank goodness he's been able to uh, recover. But it was a long and very worrying process. So there's, there's uh, those direct experiences, I think, have just reminded us why we're doing what we're doing. Because I think, you know, we see in Toronto now, a lot of people are forgetting why we're doing this. And they, they're eager to just connect and be in social groups again. Yeah, we've been finding as we've been experiencing those things as well, that even uh, the normal processes of grief, uh, when you're able to get together and so much is even unspoken as you come and stand shoulder to shoulder with somebody and trying to do this and participate in a, as a grieving community online uh, mm -hmm. has been very difficult. Yeah, and, I, and you know, the, in addition to the COVID virus, um, there's other uh, life is also going on in other ways, you know, and, and for people who have cancer, for example, um, you know, they're, they're often not even being able to receive treatment or uh, I have a friend who was diagnosed just as this was beginning, who's not, not met his oncologist and who's, who's creating a tr uh, care plan for the cancer he has. Um, we had one of our members who was a long-term assistant who, um, Susan, who uh, I'm going to share a word with, uh, with you about from Susan, because she was just a wise teacher in large. And uh, it, uh, it was very painful. She died from cancer after many, many years of being ill. Um, and we were able to be with her only through FaceTime. And the nurses were just marvelous. You know, just she, she's in fact connected to more people than if we had uh, traditionally in L'Arche, when you're, when you're at, in your last days in hospice or at home or in the hospital, you're surrounded by people 24 hours a day. We just, we're, we, that's what we do. Um, and uh, it, it, it was hard not to be able to do that directly because of the risk to being going into hospital. But we did it another way that was very meaningful. We know it was. And in fact, a group of us were praying on Zoom at the very moment that Jane got the call that Susan had died. So we were, we were united in prayer at the very moment she died. Uh, so that was very moving. And, and, and her service was, we, uh, the funeral will happen at another time, but the, the, we always gather after someone in our communities has died to share stories. And because we had to do that on Zoom, her family in California and, and people in Australia and British Columbia and, Cal and Alberta were able to be 
part of that with us in Toronto. And that was very powerful. Her whole life was really represented. So even after this is over, we're aware that, you know, maybe we need to, to include Zoom in our, when we actually can gather in the room so that we can bring more people in. It was a gift given in, in that, um, even though it was painful not to, to be together at the same time. Yeah, there are certainly a lot of things that this time is teaching us as well. John, I uh, had the opportunity to see uh, Larsh's uh, Tiny Lights video, uh, and it was, it was really kind of a, uh, a bright light. So I'm wondering if we can show that right now, uh, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, I'll just get you to maybe talk a little bit about it uh, when we come back. Super. John, that's just a, it's, what a beautiful video. It's, I, I, doesn't matter how many times I see it. I, I don't know if I get more emotional or uh, every, uh, if it's possible. Um, and, and just the beauty of the, of, of people and the diversity. I mean, the, the, I just, I think it, the video says as much as anything I've ever seen about what community can really be. We're, we're, uh, a, this time I was thinking of, 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 of Sister Sue Mosteller as one of my teachers in Larsh, 
and uh, she she talked once gave a talk once where she said the community doesn't um, the, the people are, are like gemstones the community doesn't create their value God has created each one of us with this precious value but it but it's hidden in this rock you know and and, and it takes community to to polish and to cut and polish the, the, the diamond or the ruby or the emerald or whatever jewel we are. And, uh, and then it takes community also to, to display it and, and put the, the, the light on that beauty that's been revealed um, and, and through relationships and community, through welcoming difference, through uh, believing fundamentally that every person is of value and uh, has been created um, with a purpose by God to, to bring God's um, healing and, and goodness into the world. And uh, I think the video just captures all of that. You know, even if it didn't have the lyrics of the song, just the beauty of the people and the movement and, and the instruments coming together. And there are people from uh, not only across Canada of all ages and all abilities, but there are people from even other countries. One of the guys playing a drum is from Kenya, who I met there uh, in Larsh. And uh, I just, it, just, it says so many things and so many layers, but at that end of the day, I mean, I think we feel that way in, a, in this pandemic, that we're just all so tiny, that we, you know, we can get lost. This world is, can be overwhelming. And uh, why bother, you know, uh, because it, there's nothing we can do. Um, but, but when we help each person discover their light and, and all of those lights come together, something very beautiful is created and something very powerful is created and something that really can change the world. Um, you know, so that we, we, we can believe it's gonna be all right because if we can stay close to that message. I, I said, I, I also made a connection to Susan Zimmerman um, who just died, she, who was another teacher of mine in Larsh and for many of us um, and uh, Susan, uh, was videotaped and we shared this at her funeral. I just want to say, share a few words she said. There's a fundamental vision that underlies all of Larsh that's not too apparent on the outside. Something about how each person's life is important. How there's an unrepeatable grace in the life of each person. And that that's not just for them, but it's for everybody. And I think in our community life, that's the fundamental goal, to make the particular grace and gift of each person's life available to them, their companions, and to the society at large. I, I, you know, she just captures it. <laughs> People have written whole books, but that video and that little quote captures so much of what what's important and, I and think not just for Larsh. I mean, Larsh doesn't exist just for ourselves. We're, we're, we are partners with you at Christian Horizons. We are partners with our churches and other faith communities. We're partners with universities and high schools and, and local communities all across Canada and around the world who are all committed to this work of, of building a world that's more just and compassionate and vibrant and full of life and diversity. Yeah. And we've certainly in, uh, enjoyed the partnership that we've had in working together over the years as well with Lars from Christian Horizons and in Canada. Well, John, our time is gone. Uh, and I think that's a, such a powerful word uh, and image to end on. And I just want to, again, thank you and Lars so much for joining us today. And uh, we just pray God's comfort and grace on you as well as uh, and on your organization in these days. Thank you, Neil. And we'll hold Christian Horizons and your large family and network of friends and companions too in our prayers. Well, thank you for joining our Care Point uh, today. And uh, we look forward to you joining us on other days. Uh, we have changed up the schedule uh, for our thought and prayers and Care Point. Uh, Mondays and Fridays are going to be our thought and prayer. And then Wednesdays, uh, we will be sharing our Care Point interviews. And so we look forward to seeing you there and look forward and really covet your comments as well. And if you have any questions, just send them to us and we'll be, or prayer requests requests and we will lift those up uh, and uh, thank you for joining. Bye-bye.